Hey, good evening. I'm Colonel Chris Ruga, the Garrison Commander of U.S. Army Garrison, Alaska, at Fort Wainwright. And welcome to the September uh, Housing Town Hall. Uh, we've got a wide variety of great information to, to share with all of our housing uh, residents tonight. And uh, from a COVID update to River Road Bridge, um, some information on safety, um, talking uh, family child care uh, providers uh, for opportunities both for uh, our residents to be able to have some, make some extra money while providing child care and the benefits for uh, using the uh, our FCC providers as your uh, child care uh, source of child care. Um, North Haven Communities is going to provide an update on the out year development plans um, and what renovations and construction how we're looking on those um, as well as we've got some updates on uh, some of the the less wonderful topics uh, over past months of uh, discolored water and pest control. Actually, some pretty good news stories in that respect, but uh, we'll get you an update on those. And uh, then we'll follow up with a little bit of information uh, about the changes to access control points, which we discussed earlier in the month at the uh, Arctic Information Exchange. Um, give our community update. This one really kind of be focused a little bit more on how it's going to impact uh, particular family members that reside on Fort Wainwright. And so with that, I will turn it over to Major General Andrzejczyk for some opening remarks, and then we'll get going with the rest of the brief. Thanks. Okay, good evening, uh, Major General Andrzejczyk, and Chris, thanks uh, for the opportunity for some opening remarks. I, I'll be brief. Uh, I want to thank the U.S. Army Garrison Alaska team, the Public Affairs team, uh, for, for putting this on. This this is the quarterly town hall, so this is focused on uh, privatized housing. This is not your COVID update. Um, we'll, we'll continue to run those uh, as, as we feel necessary. Um, and we also owe you a, probably a quality of life uh, update too. And uh, we'll, we'll roll that out. There, there are a lot of great things happening in Alaska and it's an exciting time. And there's other information that we'll roll out uh, as well. But as you can tell, right, uh, winter's coming. It's getting darker, it's getting colder. Um, but uh, we know we've done a lot of work uh, to, to improve uh, the, the living on Fort Wainwright, and there's a great update tonight that, that Colonel Ruga and our North Haven partners, uh, you know, are, are going are gonna to share with us tonight. They're doing a lot of great work to make sure uh, that we we improve the housing here, and there's a lot of good news uh, on the horizon. So I look forward to tonight's update. No doubt, put your questions uh, online and get them answered as best they can. Okay, and then I'll get another opportunity to come up if there's anything specific. But once again, we'd like to keep this focused on our privatized housing and all the great work that's that's going on. Thanks, Chris. All right, thanks, sir. All right, so I've got a, a about a half dozen or so topics that I'd like to cover with the community um, before Mr. Condis from North Haven Communities comes up. Uh, first topic is. Uh, COVID, and kind of an overview of COVID, uh, where we are from a community perspective. Um, we have not made a lot of changes recently with regard to the specifically to the community and installation access. And so some of the questions that consistently come up and recognizing that we're just at the end of, you know, mid to end of PCS season, we have got a lot of new residents. Um, just want, want to address some stuff that's out there um, regarding access. So. Family members, you can, bottom line, if you have family members that are coming to visit, you can get them on the installation. They can have access to the installation. If they are coming from out of state, they will be required to ROM for 14 days while they are here. Um, the information on how to request access is on the uh, Fort Wainwright, uh, U.S. Army Garrison, Alaska uh, page uh, right at the very top under access control with the gate information. And so if you got uh, questions, the contact information is there, but I would like to make sure that all of our residents know that it is possible to have visitors on the installation. We just uh, have to make care for uh, COVID, COVID measures. Um, isolation and quarantine, or quarantine isolation reporting is on there. Uh, we do ask that uh, if, if you have somebody in your house that is uh, tested COVID positive, or has been directed by public health to quarantine due to close contact, if you would please let North Haven communities know. Um, and really this is uh, just from a, a safety perspective. Um, down, I guess, a um, couple, couple places down here, um, we've got the fact that North Haven will do uh, ask questions, uh, the screening questions before they come and do maintenance but it's just that extra level of help if we know in advance and North Haven's maintenance knows in advance, 
if there's somebody who is potentially COVID positive in a house that they can, you know, take that extra level of precaution. If it's an emergency uh, work order, we North Haven is absolutely going to make sure those life health safety things are taken care of. If it's a scenario where, hey, can this wait for a period of time based on that uh, known uh, possibility of COVID that you've thankfully shared with the with uh, North Haven, we may ask and North Haven may ask, hey, can we delay this for a period of time uh, till we get past that? So appreciate the patience and uh, consideration in that. Um, Playgrounds are open um, if you're just new to the community if coming from somewhere else or maybe playgrounds have not been open. They are open uh, as General Andresiak said winter's coming. So got to probably got a few more weeks of uh, good playground use. Um, so please take advantage of those. Uh, um, North Haven communities uh, appointment only. So while we try to get back to uh, as close to regular business as normal across the installation. We do have different uh, configurations in a lot of our different buildings, um, max capacities, and depending on where, what type of office space we have, we do have different constraints and different facilities on how many people can be in different buildings. And one of those with North Haven communities where both from an installation perspective and the way North Haven and Lend-Lease as a corporate entity have uh, uh, chosen to ensure that both you and their staff remain safe is to work appointments only for the North, ha North Haven communities but uh, please call if you've got questions on those. And then uh, finally, um, yard sales. Uh, so continue those through the end of September. So we're, we're getting close to the end of yard sale season. But uh, if you still got stuff to sell, please uh, take advantage of that using the COVID measures that North Haven has been putting out. Go to the next slide. So uh, really quickly here, Bailey Bridge is open. Uh, we did ribbon, cut, ribbon cutting last week. So awesome news. You can get across the Chena River over by the golf course. Um, and get to secluded acres and the uh, Birch Hill area that way. Um, also, River Road uh, Bridge, which is under construction right now, uh, we're still on schedule to honor about the 9th of October to be completed with that project. And uh, I drive past it on a almost day daily basis to check out how they're progressing and uh, keep waiting for them to fill in that big gap that's right there before the, the bridge. So probably with everybody else, I'm anxiously waiting that bridge to be open because that's the that's the way we exit the installation most of the time as, as well. Uh, next slide. So I mentioned at the beginning, uh, family child care facilities, also known as FCCs. Um, so re really what this is, this is a opportunity to expand our capacity for child care on the installation. So we've got our child development centers and our um, uh, uh, youth center. In addition to that, we have the ability to have members of the community sign up and provide child care in their homes. And so there's a multifold benefit to this. So for those members of the community that say, hey, I would love to run some child care in my home, it's an opportunity for you to have some extra income, uh, do something you might be interested in doing already. And at the bottom of the slide, it does talk about unauthorized child care. And what we do want to limit is um, not having daycare uh, type and recurring child care in the in homes that are not part of the FCC system. And this is about safety. It's not about the Army wanting to uh, prevent you from doing something that uh, you want to do. We want to do we want you to be able to do it, but we want you to do it in a safe manner, bringing it into the fold, make sure we've got the housing inspected house inspected. Um, and so that the members who uh, of the community who are trusting their children, our most precious resource in your care, uh, are confident uh, with that. So, uh, and then the benefit from a family perspective in, in this, it does allow those opportunities uh, for a little bit lower cost. And if, if there's a uh, family that's got two kids in, in uh, multi-age and you want, uh, you want their, your children in the same uh, place together, um, that can happen at FCC, whereas they'll be divided amongst ages at the uh, CDC. So I, I would just uh, ask that anybody who's interested in doing a uh, running a uh, family child care, please contact uh, Ms. Harder, whose uh, contact information is on the, the slide there, and uh, please inquire. We we'll greatly appreciate it. Fire safety. So um, for those folks who've been around Fort Wainwright for the last year, uh, you're probably aware that we have had a couple house fires, um, and two of which have resulted in dislocation of families. Uh, thankfully, none of them have uh, resulted in any significant injury or loss of life, um, but there have been some minor injuries associated with those. And bottom line on all of them, they could have been prevented. And um, 
So 75% of the fires that have happened on Fort Wainwright over the last uh, five years have been cooktop related to include our most recent fire. Um, and uh, about 50% of them this year have been candle related. So uh, what I would ask is that please just don't walk away from your stove with it on. And we, from time to time, most folks have probably been guilty of doing something that probably be included. Um, I'm very diligent about doing that at this point, um, especially with, with the numbers here. But I, I would ask that you do that. Um, make sure the candles are out before you go to bed in the evenings or before, truly before you leave a room. Um, uh, North Haven has provided uh, fire extinguishers um, in, the, in each of the kitchens. What I would ask also is that you make sure those are accessible. Uh, there's been some really good uh, fire safety videos that the uh, North Haven communities, or sorry, um, PAO and uh, um, Sergeant Major and the fire department have done recently, as well as information that's been put out by North Haven communities on fire safety. I would ask if you've got questions, especially if you've got kids in the house, go through and review that information on fire safety and just make sure you're keeping your family safe. And then uh, finally, the bottom bullet on there below the pictures of some of our uh, fires, um, fire damage, is really about uh, insurance. Um, the majority of the victims of the fires that we've had this year have not had uh, renter's insurance. And relatively low cost at, uh, you know, $12 to $20 a month for about $20,000 worth of coverage on, on average. Um, I'm not advocating any particular insurance company, uh, but that is a relatively low cost to pay to make sure that in the if, tragic event that there is a fire, that you are not left with no belongings. Anyway, next slide. So, uh, Tenant Bill of Rights, this is not crazy new information, uh, but I, we did want to make sure that the community is aware that the Secretary of Defense and uh, the Secretary of the Army uh, did approve the Tenant Bill of Rights and uh, did, did sign that about a month and a half ago or so. Um, all of our residents have been sent a copy of the Tenant Bill of Rights by North Haven Communities. If by some chance you did not receive that, it got lost in, in your uh, email, please contact uh, North Haven. They'll be happy to send you a copy of that as well. Also at the bottom of the, this slide is a web address that's got a copy, a uh, link to the Tenant Bill of Rights and a plain language brief that all of our brand new residents are receiving. It really kind of talks through what the Tenant Bill of Rights is. It goes through all of the uh, the points associated with it and allows you know, really an uh, opportunity for dialogue back to the uh, the housing office and or North Haven if you've got questions associated with that. Um, so without going into too much uh, additional detail on the uh, Bill of Rights, if you have questions, please let us know. And so now I'd like to uh, turn the podium over to Mr. Mike Condis from North Haven Communities to talk to a few subjects from their perspective. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Condis. I'm the Senior Development Manager for North Haven Communities. Um, uh, as many of you might be aware, um, we did a privatized housing uh, survey um, back in 2019, I'm proud to say that um, both Fort Greeley and Fort Wainwright scored in the top 10 out of the uh, Army um, installations, with Fort Greeley scoring number one and Fort Wainwright scoring number nine with a very good, Fort Greeley was, had an outstanding score. Um, the resident uh, satisfaction results and targets, um, they did take a slight uh, dip down from the previous year. Um, and we have an action plan. Uh, we're working on an action plan right now to score, uh, to address any scores that uh, were under 85%. And uh, we will be uh, addressing those uh, as we can moving forward. Um, part of that, uh, part of addressing those issues is the uh, initiation of our out year development plan for FY19 through 23 to help improve and sustain uh, the privatized housing here at Fort Wainwright. Uh, so with Chena Bend, uh, we replaced uh, 58 roofs in those units. We completed that last October of 2019, and we're currently in the process of renovating 58 FGO homes in that same neighborhood. Um, we currently have 41 units completed and 10 are in progress with seven upcoming 
Um, we hope to be completed with that project <clears throat> by the end of this year. Um, with some of the COVID impacts, it slowed some of the movement with some of the residents. Otherwise, we could have completed that a little, a little sooner. Uh, in our Bear Paw neighborhood, if you've seen that, uh, I'm sure most of you have seen that neighborhood under construction between uh, 601st and 602nd adjacent to Gaffney. Um, we're in the process of building 32 new JNCO homes with all the associated infrastructure. Uh, there's eight fourplex buildings going up. Those are three bedroom homes. And uh, right now we have framing and roofing and site utilities underway. And uh, we estimate those to be completed in uh, the July timeframe of uh, summer of 2021. Um, this year has been the rainiest or the, wet, the wettest uh, 12 months on record. And that has slowed down some of our, our construction on site, uh, especially as it pertains to uh, site development, curbs and gutter and streets and utilities. Uh, in Southern Cross, uh, infill neighborhood, um, we have four new JNCO homes scheduled uh, to begin in the spring of next summer, uh, spring of 2021, next summer. And then in Southern Cross, uh, we, we plan on uh, renovating uh, 40 of those units in the initial phase of the out year development plan. Uh, those will be interior finishes, such as appliances, flooring, light fixtures, cabinets, countertops, uh, new paint, and so on. Uh, so that'll really help out that neighborhood. And then the, the balance of those units will be renovated in the, the, the out year development plan that follows to that. Uh, the total cost of the out year is 51.1 million. And uh, we're excited to uh, and privileged to, uh, to improve the product here on Fort Wainwright. We're looking very forward to that. So I'll hand it back over to you, sir. All right, so I mentioned a couple topics that we had uh, the, in the past that have been up in the, the greatest of topics to, that discuss, and that was some uh, discolored water. And so for uh, folks that have been around Fort Wainwright for a while, and uh, quite honestly, the entire uh, interior Alaska area, uh, you're probably aware that there are uh, lead and manganese that, uh, regular, uh, that naturally occur in the water here and can cause discoloration as it interacts with, with the piping. And, and so Fort Wainwright, that is no exception. Um, and in past years, as the uh, um, Department of Public Works and uh, Doyen Utilities has coordinated to do flushing of the lines in the spring, it has churned up a lot of sediment and had uh, discolored water um, that would come through the, our residents' uh, uh, houses. In uh, 2019, uh, Doyen Utilities completed a study uh, the, for unidirectional flushing. So they start that flushing at one end and really work it all the way to the other end. And the result of this is uh, we're really excited to be able to say that in 2019, we had 102 uh, discolored water calls in 2020 utilizing that uh, um, the results of that study and that unidirectional flushing down to 18. And so it does occur sometimes, you know, depending on backup and, and where it happens to be in the lines in our you know, 50, 60 plus year old uh, infrastructure that we have in some parts um, of the base, um, but huge improvements and we're really appreciative of Doyen Utilities for doing that study and, um, you know, trying to make sure that our uh, uh, residents uh, don't experience what is not unsafe, it's completely safe, but obviously none of us want discolored water in our, uh, in our houses and it's uh, you know, definitely optically uh, unsatisfying so huge improvements there um, if you got questions please let us know uh, next topic uh, I'll hit real quickly is uh, pest control um, so in recent years we have had a uh, number of roach calls yes even here in Alaska where it's a negative uh, 30 degrees for uh, months on end potentially we have roach calls and there are roaches in the area why are there roaches because we're here they come in with our boxes um, the, the different types of roaches we have are from all over the world and it's because of the military and because the military is here uh, that we have those. And so it's not Alaska and it's not the particular housing here, it's good old U.S. Army and, and our household goods. With that said, uh, 
North Haven communities and uh, um, Doyon Utilities and the Department of Public Works have gone to great lengths to address the pest concern that we have had on the installation because none of us want roaches in our in our house if at all possible and so they've they started a systematic um, pest control process uh, this year that really traps uh, traps the pests and, and draws them in to prevent uh, and prevents uh, chemicals from being in houses it doesn't uh, it really treats them in the utilidors that we have which is the where the issue spots are and we've decreased the uh, roach calls for 2020 um, by half of what they were in 2019, 18 and 19. And yes, I recognize we still have a couple months to go, but we are on track to be significantly better. Uh, we've been doing this for a year. We've got some data on the hotspots on where it's working and uh, how best to implement that. And we will continue that um, going forward. So again, a, kind of another good news story on, on one of these uh, not so great topics that we've discussed at previous, uh, previous um, town halls. Um, and Mike, were you going to talk winter readiness, or is that uh, that me on that one? Okay, um, uh, I'll, I'll talk. I'll talk it briefly. Mike can. Uh, this is one of our transitional points. <laughs> Mike can hit anything that I don't hit really well. But as we're uh, as General Andrzejczyk said again, winter's coming. Um, take a look at removing your air conditioners and uh, make sure that those are getting winterized. Uh, for those folks that either have window units or the the direct exhaust uh, types. Um, Making sure the windows are uh, closed completely, um, that uh, your the hose bibs are, are off as this gets starts getting below freezing. You know, you've got those turned off. Your hose is taken uh, taken in, um, so you're you're not freezing there. Um, and, and really, just kind of going around the house and doing an assessment of what winterization needs to be done. If you've got something that North Haven can take care of. Uh, especially windows, door seals, any of those things, now's the time to let North Haven know before it gets to, you know, 10, 15 degrees when you've got a huge draft. If it's if you can see light coming in around your door, please give North Haven a call so they can come in and get some, uh, some sealant um, uh, in there. Same thing for windows. Um, and then before snow starts falling, probably a good thing to start doing to pick up around your yard, get all those kids' toys, dogs' toys, and all that other good stuff pulled inside uh, so that it's not a whole bunch of wonderful surprises when the snow melts. Uh, you got a bunch of uh, unusable equipment uh, coming this spring. All right, so, let's see. All right, with that, I will turn it back over to Mike to talk some uh, resident events coming from North Haven. Thank you, sir. So in October, uh, we have uh, several uh, resident appreciation. Uh, we have the resident appreciation month photo contest uh, through October from October 5th through the October 28th. Uh, we also have fall decor photos. Uh, please submit your photos uh, by October 5th, uh, somewhere between the 5th through the 9th, and uh, we'll be judging those photos on Facebook um, October 13th through the 15th. Um, the Alaska Wild Places uh, or Wildlife photos. Uh, please submit your photos by October uh, between October 13th and October 16th, and uh, we will judge those photos on Facebook October 19th through October 21st. Um, the pumpkin carving, uh, please submit your photos October 19th through the, uh, October 23rd, and we'll be judging those photos on Facebook October 26th through October 28th. And uh, Mary, our resident... Um, Service coordinator, uh, resident event coordinator has been doing a really great job uh, with uh, COVID being present. Uh, a lot of virtual events going on right now, and and uh, we're, we're happy we can do that. And she's been doing a great job. Uh, Halloween events, uh, the Art of the Month contest. Uh, there will be one $50 gift card winner per neighborhood. And uh, North Haven team members will drive around on the mornings of October 28th and October 29th. And so please have uh, your lights on your displays so that's that's visible. <clears throat> um, the Facebook's Children's Costume Contest, again, there will be one $25 gift card winner. And please submit your photos uh, October 19th through the 23rd, and we'll judge those photos on Facebook October 26th through the 27th. Um, Prepackaged treat, uh, trick-or-treat bags uh, at the North Haven Community Center um, that actually, I believe, will be changing. Um, uh, that event will be changing with some of the new developments that came out today. So uh, there will be more to come on that, 
and we'll, uh, North Haven will be sure to inform everybody through social media. Um, but please make sure all your photo contest entries uh, are sent to marketing at nhcalaska.com, and then the albums will be created uh, for the judging on Facebook. Um, the resident portal, um, if you haven't checked out the resident portal, please do. Um, it's been very successful. Um, you, can, you can access it through your, uh, from your computer or your mobile device. You'll save a lot of time. It's very efficient. If you have any questions on how to, uh, to do it, uh, please contact your, your community management team, and they can, they can help you if you have any questions on that. Um, we've included the points of contact uh, on here for you as well for North Haven communities and the other services that are available for you. Uh, for North Haven communities, you'll be asking for Ron Johnson, the project director, or Todd Wentland, director of property management, and we've included the, the phone number for the work order maintenance desk, which is 356-7000. You'll, you'll hit option one. And then also the North Haven Community Center is 356-7000, option three, then option one. And then the NHC service hotline is 356-7000. And please select number one for maintenance, and somebody will be getting back with you right away. Um, we've also included uh, the DMO customer service for the, bar the barracks, um, residential communities, uh, uh, the RCI team, to include Lori Dallas, Ken Latham, and Jennifer Bauer. Uh, their phone numbers are on there as well. Housing services office, the HSO office, for Mike Lachinsky and David Perkins, and then Director of Public Works, DPW, Tim Sponseller, and Dorothy Pender. And then, of course, the user act, uh, CG hotline. Uh, at the bottom there. So if you have any questions and need to contact anybody, we've provided all of that. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, closing topic that I have before we start answer, uh, address some of the questions that, that have been uh, sent in. Um, changes to the access control points. And so at the beginning of the month at the uh, Arctic uh, Community Information Exchange, uh, I shared that we are going to be implementing some changes to the access control points uh, based on uh, really kind of securing the installation a little bit better really at the high speed avenues of approach um, for which we've candidly we've had some uh, more more uh, incidents uh, than than either General Andreziak and I are comfortable with with a lack of uh, security and lack of access or final denial barriers. And so really what we're getting at here is to ensure that folks who try to come on the installation um, who shouldn't be there, that we've got some way to stop them if they blow past the gate. Um, long term, uh, we're working on the, the full in-ground act, uh, active vehicle barriers, um, but that's probably a couple years out before those projects are in place. Short term, we're, gonna, we're going to implement some changes to all three of the gates. Um, I talked at the uh, Arctic, Community, or Arctic Information Exchange that we were looking at doing it on or about the 1st of October. We are, in fact, going to push that back uh, to about the 9th of October uh, to coincide with River Road uh, opening. Um, so less traffic concerns there. So. Uh, on your screen, you've got some of the, what the updated hours for the gates will be um, once River Road reopens as we implement these changes. Um, I can go to the next slide. So just real quickly, to, I'll focus on two gates in particular here. Um, the main gate, uh, which really will impact anybody potentially who makes a right turn uh, on 599th Street um, and the communities of Garrett Heights and Southern Cross. Um, that potentially that's the, the main egress, ingress and egress that you use to get to your housing, you will have to go up the next, uh, next street. Why are we blocking that off? Got a lot of questions on why that is. Uh, the bottom line, to put these access control uh, vehicle barriers in, we have to have enough distance between the gate and where the vehicle barrier would be so that if somebody runs the gate, we've got time to activate the barrier and stop somebody from getting access to the installation. Um, or a vehicle uh, getting access to insulation that should not. And, and for that reason, we have to go all the way up. There, we've had questions about why not move the gate back, uh, a variety of different things about changing the geometry of the gate. And the reality is we don't own all that we own just before the uh, traffic circle. Um, we don't own all the way out to Richardson Highway. So we do have, don't have the ability to go that way. 
Um, and right now, this is the best configuration we, we have uh, to secure the, secure the installation a little bit better. Um, so on or about the, the 9th of October, um, and probably a little bit before that, we'll start pre-positioning barriers. Uh, you'll see barriers that will ultimately block off uh, 599 Street um, for, for traffic in either direction. And we'll have um, barriers that funnel all traffic across a active uh, vehicle barrier that should not, and right now, uh, should not change traffic patterns too much. So I'll tell you, I will be out there the very first day that we're there uh, during all high traffic times to take a look at, see how things are going. And we're going to monitor it very closely um, over the next, uh, you know, the first week or so. And if we need to make adjustments because we've got traffic patterns that uh, you know, are backing up past the traffic circle for large amounts of times, we will make adjustments. We, we are not doing this in a vacuum. Uh, we are absolutely uh, paying attention to uh, the concerns of the community, both the folks that live in Garrett Heights, Southern Cross, the folks that uh, access the, um, ultimately will access Arctic Light, folks that are going to the uh, um, child development centers and head up that, that direction, uh, as well as our civilian employees uh, on the installation. Um, so I think that's what I've got on, on, uh, on that one. Um, if there's questions, uh, that, that come in, I've got a few questions at the end of this that have already been asked and I'll, I'll address those and any, please answer any other questions there. Um, trainer gate, we have made one change to trainer gate, the, since, uh, we initially discussed this at the beginning of the month and that's the Snapdragon. We initially said, Hey, we're going to close off Snapdragon. Same real reason we're closing off 599th, uh, going the, uh, on the right side. Um, coming in main gate, uh, we were going to close off Snapdragon on the left side. Coming in um, trainer gate, we actually we're going to make this egress only. So you, while you will have to go all the way up to uh, River Road, make a left, and then make a left into Sitgu Basin uh, to enter the the uh, that neighborhood, anybody will be able to exit egress either onto River Road or um, through on Snapdragon Lane to head out out of the installation. Um, and the same question we got on why can't the uh, barrier be before Snapdragon, again, it goes to the amount of land that we as the Army own. The distances just do not allow that. Yeah, next slide. And uh, Badger Gate, I won't take him any more time on Badger Gate, uh, not near any of the neighborhoods, but uh, still plan on doing that at Badger Gate as well. And I will say, um, long term, we, we definitely will work to get two lanes of traffic at, at Main Gate. Uh, just at the moment, that's the capacity that we have is that one lane. But um, we'll address it, address situations as they come up. Uh, so a couple questions here. Um, well, not necessarily going to read through all of these, um, but uh, I hit the Siku Basin on limiting access uh, to Snapdragon for for egress. Um, Concerned about going down to one lane, the main gate, acknowledge that, and we'll monitor that closely. Ultimately, our goal is to provide two lanes, but at the moment, our capacity is one. Um, we'll keep everybody in the community posted on that. Um, ability to remove snow. This is absolutely something that we looked at before we uh, embarked on this endeavor, both, both with uh, Department of Public Works, DES, and our uh, uh, base ops contractor. Uh, we've got the plan in place to be able to clear both the lane and around the vehicle barriers uh, so they continue to operate in the snow. Um, there have been concerns about speeders um, in the area, um, you know, that this may change traffic patterns. Uh, Direction of Emergency Services is very well aware of, the, of those concerns and we're tracking, you know, what streets may have increased traffic or likely will have increased traffic and we will increase the uh, patrols in those areas um, to make sure that we're, we're monitoring and uh, traffic remains uh, adhering to uh, traffic laws. Uh, next slide. Um, I think I hit the uh, closing down the, the side streets um, on the proper security and why we're doing that distance. Um, the Snapdragon uh, is exit only um, and the reason we are not making that being able to turn in, there's just, we can't provide a gap in the barrier and still provide security. We have to have people to be able to go in over that active vehicle barrier in order to provide that level of security for the community. And again, we recognize that we have a river that goes through uh, Fort Wainwright, yes, um, and somebody could theoretically take a canoe or a boat down the river and come onto the installation. What we're really getting at right now is those, the high-speed avenues approach where somebody could drive a vehicle 
with something in the vehicle or a group of individuals quickly through the gate um, and making sure that uh, that is uh, eliminated as a uh, option for getting on this installation and protecting everybody who lives and works here. Um, and then uh, finally, I think I mentioned it, but uh, River Road uh, Bridge, uh, can we delay it? And yes, we absolutely are delaying it. Uh, the good thing is that uh, it's not going to be too much past the uh, beginning of October. And so uh, hopefully that will diminish any of those uh, traffic concerns by having only one access point to that side of the installation. All right, and I think uh, that's what I had um, scheduled. I know we've got a bunch of questions that have come in, uh, come in online, and I will attempt to address some of these um, and hopefully get to, uh, uh, get to the majority of them. So we, there were several questions about FCCs and um, our ability, you know, the, the time associated with processing uh, FCC applications, and is it going to be streamlined? Um, you know, the Army requirements are the Army requirements that we have to do that, and we, we will work to streamline those as quickly as possible. I did see some comments say that the processing is going a little faster, which I'm glad to hear, um, but that is something that our first priority is ensuring that the, uh, the safety of the children that are in these, uh, um, in our FCC providers' houses are safe, and that's just making sure that our FCC providers are vetted and that the physical surroundings around the kids are, are good to go. Um, it was asked if uh, hourly care is going to return. At some point, yes, um, probably not in, in the near future based on capacity. So where we are right now, this is Army-wide with uh, – child care facilities, we are limited by space and the amount and, and providers, the, the number of uh, children that we can have. And right now, the number of um, employees and our child care providers is not the issue at Fort Wainwright. The issue that we have at Fort Wainwright ultimately is the amount of space that we physically have. And we have opened up every possible space to make and are maximizing the space that we have on our child care uh, centers to have every possible child that we can get into our facilities, into our facilities. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I was talking uh, FCCs tonight is anybody who wants, who can come on uh, with an FCC, earn a little bit extra money and take care of some of our uh, most precious resources will take the pressure off of the limitations that we have as an enterprise, an Army-wide enterprise uh, during this COVID time. And then hopefully as COVID uh, starts uh, uh, going down in the near future, um, hopefully, uh, we will uh, be able to expand that capacity and get more people in. Um, Another question, sir, is uh, do you know if the USL and LASCAT will be available this winter for families to utilize once the temperatures dip? So, yes, uh, so we will uh, We ultimately um, get the uh, LFCAC open, at least portions of it, um, uh, with the uh, – Recreation area is our intent. Um, as mentioned earlier, we got the child care or the uh, um, playgrounds that are open right now. We recognize that again, winter is coming and they're not going to be open forever. Um, and so, the intent is to get that direct to get those open. Um, the um, what was it the, the USO? Yeah, uh, the USO um, has been open. Um, I think they they are currently closed uh, based on some staffing concerns. Um, but they will they will return to being open, and we'll, we can talk with them on the hours. Um, but for the last month or two, they've been open on the weekends. Um, I did see a question about um, uh, RVs and campers in driveways, um, so I do want to address that. So the real issue with why there is an installation policy on not having prolonged uh, storage of uh, campers and RV in driveways ultimately comes to a safety issue. Um, on two fronts. Uh, one is it blocks vision um, as you're going down streets where kids could run out in a street and a driver not see them. That's probably the biggest, most primary one. And the second one is clearing around, uh, around those vehicles for snow. Um, so for those reasons, uh, North Haven does provide temporary approval to keep vehicles in, in driveways. Um, Part of it's asking and part of it's where you live. And, and, um, and I saw a comment on here that's allowed in officer housing, but it is not allowed in enlisted housing. That is a not true statement. Um, every house, everyone is considered individually, and it depends on what the reason uh, 
is for that camper being there. If, if it's it asked to be there for a week period of time, because that is you know somebody moving in or moving out. You know, I, I'll tell you, if you drive by quarters one right now, my my RV is parked in our driveway. It's getting winterized on Saturday, and after that, it will not be in our driveway anymore. And we are in the process on a daily basis of dragging some of our stuff out of there in, in, in that process. And so if you're winterizing, you know, your stuff, that's a something to talk with North Haven about. Hey, it's going to take me a couple days. You're getting ready to go out on a trip. I need two days to put stuff into my vehicle beforehand. I, I think all that stuff's completely on board, uh, above board and stuff that we have talked with North Haven in the past about. North Haven's like, Ab absolutely, just come on online and have those discussions. But to leave it in the in a driveway for weeks and months on end, um, it does get into the safety risk. Um, you know, I, if we are full at uh, the Eagle's Nest on the installation, I know there are opportunities off off post. Um, we are happy to provide the opportunity to store. Uh, RVs at the Eagle's Nest, um, but we do not have unlimited capacity. Um, so, and if yeah, I'll talk to MW, I don't know if we have a list of alternate uh, um, storage facilities handy, but I, I will talk with MWR. I think that's probably something that we can uh, we could probably keep um, of all the other facilities in town that, that store stuff if we are in fact full. Um, any other ones, Brady, that I'm, I'm missing here as I'm scrolling yeah, through? Asked, uh, yeah, so, and I'll, I'll address it cursory um, on uh, on Halloween. So we're still in the process of developing the uh, the very details of the plan. But I can tell you there will be an event on the 31st of, uh, of October on the installation that provides a safe alternative for trick-or-treating. We are not going to allow house-by-house um, -house trick or treating this year. Um, CDC guidelines, if, you'd see, if you've seen them in the last couple of days that have come out, that's considered a high-risk activity, as is trunk or treat. Um, and, you know, as we're trying to minimize the COVID risk on the installation, um, we are trying to make sure that we provide the safest possible opportunity for our, our community. So we recognize that Halloween's a huge event for families and kids, um, and we absolutely want to be able to do that. Um, we'll provide that safe opportunity, um, and we'll get details out here in just in the next couple of days. I would say uh, by the beginning of next week, we'll have some significant details out on what to expect so you can start planning. And ultimately what it's going to be, uh, say, is uh, SFRGs, um, USO, ASYMCA, um, uh, AFES, any of the other organizations on the installation who are interested in participating in uh, – our trick-or-treating event will have the opportunity to do that and it should be a pretty uh, pretty good event uh, based on what I'm hearing from the team that's putting it together so um, I won't take any detailed questions on that tonight just because we're still working out the exact uh, pieces of information but uh, you know no later in the beginning of next week we'll have a lot of a lot more detail out to the community all right Okay, um, as I, with that, um, I do not have uh, really any more additional closing remarks other than to say thank you for uh, being here and being online. If we missed any of the comments uh, that were on the live feed, we'll definitely go back uh, with the garrison team and police those up and get information to you. Um, we greatly appreciate you participating tonight, uh, both watching and the questions that came in. And uh, uh, Thanks for your time. And I see one more. There was one question on there about um, concerns over some maintenance uh, on North Haven. Um, you know, if, if you still have some maintenance concerns that haven't been addressed, um, the recommendation on there to reach out to uh, Todd Wentland or Kathleen Condis, absolutely accurate uh, um, points of contact to reach out to. Um, you can always also reach out to either myself or Sergeant Major Prizer. Um, Either via ICE is always a good way to get a hold of us, and we absolutely will dialogue back with you. I would ask that you please put your contact information. If you're going to put an ICE comment in, please let us uh, help you out by calling you and contacting you and, and helping answer your problem. Um, that we, we would love to do that. Um, and so with that, sir, I'll turn it over to you for final remarks. Okay, Chris, thanks. I appreciate uh, it's a great update tonight. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of good questions. I want to thank the North Haven team, Mike. Thanks for, for the update and everything you guys are doing. Uh, you know, it's go through the, the, the results from last year. You know, you got the, you're in the top 10 of installations uh, in the Army. I think that's a great place to be. 
Um, I know there's going to be a survey again in here in the near future. We'll, we'll release the dates on that. We've got to make sure that uh, we get better participation. Look, your feedback matters. Um, I can tell you that between the garrison commander and North Haven, we take the briefs in terms of how we're addressing all the issues that come up in there, and I think they're doing a great job. And I think uh, Colonel Ruga, you know, just uh, just showing that the, how we've addressed the, the concerns on the water or whether it be pest control and how they put controls in there to keep those things down. Uh, the, the team here is committed to, to improving uh, the living conditions here, which I think are still really good, all right, but they're still chipping away at, on, on the margins of those things that are important to you. And, and I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing. It's a tough job, and, uh, and I think we got a, we got a great team that, that's here, um, and we'll continue to work at that. And, you know, when you look at $51.1 million in the out years, potentially to get, get some more there, all that is is, is better uh, housing uh, for our families here on, on Fort Wainwright. And so thanks to, to the folks uh, that are out there that tuned in. Thanks for your thoughtful questions. Uh, look, there's a lot of times where we're going to make tough decisions, right? We're, we're in an interesting time in the COVID environment, and we're not going to be out of it anytime here in the near future. Um, you know, so we're, so we're juggling that on one hand, right? We still got to generate readiness uh, for the Army and be prepared to respond to anything, all right? And we have a responsibility to protect the installation and, and those that live on it, right? So sometimes there's a tough choice uh, such as vehicle barriers, but, uh, you know, that's, that's an inconvenience that we'll work around. I have no doubt that we'll adjust our schedules and we'll get through that too. And then in the future is get the, the right facilities in, in terms of the investment and, and the proper, uh, barriers and, and entry control points that, that we do need on the installation. So I appreciate your, your support on that, your understanding. All right. And I think as, as we continue through the COVID environment, like there, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, it will continue to be a challenge and we'll have to alter the way we, we do business on a day-to-day -day basis. The only way we get through this, right, is, is being a great teammate to everybody else on, on the installation. And, and I uh, appreciate everything that you've done to date. Um, there's some times that we got to kind of dial in some controls to, to get things reeled back in. The winter, obviously, the concern is as more folks tend to go inside, that there's increased risk that goes along with that. Um, I just need your, your help of being a great teammate, all right, and following those golden rules. Right to, to make sure that we're looking out after after one another because this is really about protecting one another. So so thanks again for all your time and then thanks again for the team for putting this on and all the work that that you're doing uh, to commit to our soldiers and our families. Thank you.